I think we'll get started, Ingrid. I might just start the formalities and there's people coming. Good, uh... Okay, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to all of our members and our guests to our very own London Accra Global Chamber Meetup. My name is Katie Keith. I am the Executive Director for the Global Chamber here in London. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Ingrid Asensio, Deputy Director for the Global Chamber in Accra and co-founder and general manager of XWA Expand West Africa, who will be co-moderating with me. Welcome, Ingrid. It's great to have you on with us today. For thank those you of so you, much. Thank you. And for those of you who are new to visiting Global Chamber, we are a growing global community of CEOs, executives and leaders in 525 metro regions around the world. We're pretty much everywhere. We're focused on helping companies grow within and across metropolitan areas. And we're the only organization in the world with hundreds of locations that helps executives grow sustainable business through warm connections and virtual services. We are on a mission, guys. We're on a mission to do business just as easy across the other side of the world as it is to do business right here down the street. And today we are focused on bringing our two metros together between London and Accra to explore future trade opportunities and collaborations within our community. Additionally, we have some great speakers on board today who are gonna be talking about agri financial and business services. And they're gonna share more about some of the opportunities that are happening, some of the trends and some of the things to think about. So hopefully you find it informative, fun, and a lot of connectivity today. Our agenda, as I said, it's going to be interactive and we're going to give the floor to each of our speakers to share more about the opportunities to hand. We'll then open up for a group discussion and Q&A. We also hope to have plenty of time for breakout rooms so that you all have the opportunity to meet one another, connect, find synergy. And on that note, I'd like for you all to add your contact details into our chat bar so that you can connect with one another outside of the meeting. It's gonna be a very quick hour ahead so let's make the most of the connections that we have in front of us today. I'm now going to get started and hand over to Ingrid, who is going to introduce our first speaker of the day. Over to you, Ingrid. Thank you very much, Katie. And hopefully this webinar will promote economic development through bilateral relationships that will create jobs, improve trade and increase uh, investment opportunities. For our fellow Ghanaians, our first speaker does not need introductions. For those outside of the scope, Mr. Grant is the head of the Ghana Investment Promotion Center under the office of the President of Ghana. He is unquestionably recognized in the fields of financial markets and investment and has co-founded a number of companies, including Grand Dupuis Investment Limited and Praxis uh, Fortune Caliber. Mr. Grant is a great leader and his accomplishments go beyond Ghana's borders as he's well recognized in the whole continent, having successfully led a number of advisory mandates involving both equity and debt transactions, including the development and implementation of one of the largest agriculture funds in sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, if I had to name all Mr. Grant's achievements, there would not be time left for this webinar. And as Mr. Grant's time is so valuable, without any further ado, please, Mr. Grant, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and um, a, a warm welcome to all of you. Um, indeed, it's my pleasure to be on this platform um, today, and uh, I'm, I'm delighted to speak to all of you. Um, I, I, I think that the relationship between the UK and Ghana is one that is deeply ingrained in our cultures um, from very long ago. And, you know, Ghana is one of those countries that had virtually gotten um, a significant experience with many of the European countries, from the Swedish to the Dutch to the Danes, mm. to the, even to the Germans, and many others, uh, the Portuguese who were there, uh, but eventually it seemed like uh, the British who settled to do trade with Ghana. And uh, prior to our independence, Ghana was um, recognized as one of the British you know, landmarks on the continent. And so we do have a long pedigree and a relationship that uh, I believe should today um, definitely augur well for our um, uh, 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 forward-moving 
um, engagements. Mm -hmm. And for us, um, if we were to do business with any country in the world, um, in the developed world, it should be the UK. Um, but so before I go on to speak about it, let me just talk, a, a, say a few things about Ghana. Um, Ghana is unique in many ways um, and has achieved quite a number of firsts on the global, you know, on the global time landscape. Uh, first of all, we are, I, I dare say that we are the only country that can claim or boast of being in the center of the world. We are the only country on latitude zero, longitude zero. So as I often say, we have a 360 degree uh, view as, uh, of our relationships, never mind that some mm -hmm. relationships have a long and daring tenure than others. And so we, we are very pleased uh, that we engage. But apart from that, we are also um, known to be politically stable and therefore um, mm -hmm. and, and dear ourselves to most investors. And uh, Ghana is, is recognized as the most investor-friendly place in West Africa. Um, I always say that the Ghana story is best expressed as the three O's, opportunity, openness, and optimism. Opportunity because we are resource rich. Mm -hmm. um, we are well endowed with gold, diamonds, bauxite, iron ore, manganese, lithium, oil and gas, not to mention that a significant land, um, mm -hmm. a significant proportion of our land mass, about 60% of that land mass is agricultural land. And, and therefore we have everything that should enable us um, actually grow as an economy. And um, that, that um, should I say opportunity is what we are now today um, setting out um, to lead our, our development um, uh, of the economy. And um, actually governed by the president's uh, very famous remark of a Ghana beyond aid, where we want to leverage these resources and opportunities um, to grow, not through um, handouts and gifts from developed countries, but through sustainable partnerships for linkages and trade. And that's why we think that um, that, that opportunity can definitely be leveraged, um, leveraged strongly um, to foment a stronger uh, trading partnership. Secondly, our openness, of course, is well known. We are known to be pretty friendly. We are also known to uh, have a, a penchant for the respect of law. Um, and we, we have a very aggressive reform um, uh, agenda of making Ghana the best place to do business and the best place to invest in the medium term. Uh, but we do engage with our investors. We try to get them to understand where we are. and We try to understand what their needs are and then deal with them on that note and ensure that we have a mutually beneficial relationship. Um, but we are also, and, 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 and we also, Ghana is known to be um, um, political, the political stability, which I spoke about before, um, is very, very important um, for our country going forward. Um, oops, sorry. I think somebody's just knocking at my door. If you could just oblige me for a second. networking my apologies uh, <laughs> my apologies um but but you know i i did say that we were very open in that regard and and willing to engage and it's instructive that ghana and the uk have this um uh, the ghana uk uh, business council at a very high level uh, which is enabling us to resolve quite a number of problems that we have and ensuring that uh, the opportunities are, are manifested in a mutually beneficial way. Um, so we are very pleased about that. But for me, the most important is the last O, which is that we are pretty optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, we are optimistic because uh, many of the things that we set out to do, um, we've achieved them. And prior to the pandemic and this mm -hmm. Russian war, um, Ghana was on a real, you know, tangent for growth. Unfortunately, like almost every economy in the world, we, we were also hit. And, um, and so we, we are having to do significant work to reverse um, whatever um, problems we've recently um, gotten into and re-establish ourselves back on the growth paradigm and be, you know, should I say to grow back stronger and, and better than before? Indeed, 
Our optimism is very well grounded. And the three years preceding the COVID pandemic, Ghana accelerated to a, a, an average growth rate of 7% annually, which was one of the fastest in the world. And even during the pandemic, when many countries were railed into, into recession, uh, we did not go into recession. We still had positive growth of 0.72%. And then in 2021, against all indications, our economy grew at 5.4%. And even this year, when we are grappling under the issues of debt and inflation, which almost every country is also saddled with, um, we've seen in the first quarter a growth of 3.3% and in the second quarter a growth of 4.8%. So despite the ravages of the pandemic and the war, um, our economy is still growing, which should be good music to the ears of the investor. And um, even as we grapple with macroeconomic issues, we believe that we still present a very credible and very interesting opportunity for mm -hmm. investment. But let me just um, go a little bit into um, the trade, the Ghana-UK trade relationship. And we must recognize mm -hmm. that trade and investments are the two sides of a coin and uh, they go together. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ghana actually ranks as um, the UK's 79th largest trading partner as of 2021, mm -hmm. making up only 0.1% of all UK trade. And I believe that that can certainly, certainly can be improved. Um, um, in, in many quarters. And in the, in the four quarters leading to the end of 2021, total trading goods and services, that's imports plus exports, between the UK and Ghana reached uh, a billion pounds, an increase of 9.1% or 84 million pounds from the four quarters leading to the end of 2022. Of this 1 billion, um, total exports, UK exports to Ghana amounted to 660 million, which was an increase of 14.2% or 82 mm. million compared to the four quarters at the end of 2021. Of the total 660 million exported by the UK to Ghana, um, 210 million uh, was for services, 450 million, uh, which was about 68% of the good was for goods. Therefore, compared to 2020, we've seen that there's been a growth um, of UK exports to Ghana uh, by 30, almost 34%. Um, approximately 114 million, whilst UK exports of services to Ghana decreased by 13.2 or 32 million uh, pounds. On the other side, Ghana's total exports to the mm. UK amounted to 347 million at the end of 2021, an increase of 0 0.6 from the or 2 million dollars from a uh, 2 million pounds from the previous year of 2020. Of this amount, um, goods made up of uh, made up 141 million or 41 percent of the lot and services made up 206 million or about 60 percent of the lot a total reversal of when you look at from the uk side now whilst uk imports of services from ghana increased by 21.2 percent or 36 million over the same period uk imports of goods from ghana decreased by approximately 19 percent or, or um, by some 34 million over 2020. But I dare say that on the back of the UK Ghana Business Council, which is at a high level, I, I am comfortable to understand that the UK sees Ghana as a stable place to do business and invest. And in March, 2020, um, we actually signed a trade partnership uh, between ourselves, that's between the UK and Ghana. Mm -hmm. And this deal supports a trading relationship that cumulatively should be about 1.2 billion and secures tariff-free trade and provides a platform for greater economic and cultural cooperation. Um, mm -hmm. Just to give a, a few more details and then I will cede the uh, space to the next speaker. The top five goods exported from the UK to Ghana in 2021 were one, textile and fabrics, about some 66 million or 14% of all UK goods exported to Ghana, refined oil, was 62% or 14%, or uh, 62 million pounds or 14% of the total amount. Now, meat and meat preparations, and um, I think that includes some Cumberland sausages as well, <laughs> was 23 million pounds or about 5.1% of the lot. Whilst general industrial machinery, um, intermediate machinery, we call them, was about 23 million pounds. Uh, and then miscellaneous metal manufacturers was about 21 million pounds.
But if you take compare from the top five exported goods from Ghana to the UK 2021, vegetables and fruit uh, comprise 55 million pounds or 31 or 39 percent of the total mm. goods um, UK goods imported from Ghana. Fish and shellfish was uh, some 30 million pounds or 21 percent, and then coffee, tea, cocoa, etc. was um, 24.4 million or 17 percent mm. in there is also unspecified goods of some 6.4 million pounds and metal ores and scraps of 4 million pounds and so we we when you look at this it shows that and and you look at the products that we see on either side it shows there's a tremendous opportunity to optimize some of these things and as i said before ghana is minerals rich but we are trying to move away from what our, our economy was built on, which was the export of raw materials and resources in the previous years, the erstwhile, to now adding value to those um, products, um, those raw materials. So for example, we want to convert our bauxite to aluminum before exporting just as much as we want to convert mm. our iron ore to steel and, um, and exporting. But just not export, even for the domestic market and for the West African market, not to mention the broader Africa continental free trade area market. We believe that there is enough opportunity to leverage demand um, to actually um, um, increase our trade relationships or our investment partnerships with each other. And so we are very clear on what the future, and I, I think we have our work cut out for us um, for the future in um, accelerating and optimizing the opportunities that are there. I mean, businesses are combining trade with investment to supply, uh, to plan the supply of inputs, expand into new markets, gain access to knowledge and offer services to customers. And in, in more recent times, mm -hmm. the, the what we are now calling onshoring and reshoring, et cetera, I think new opportunities are being created. Opportunities that will increase trade, uh, but also increase investment. Mm -hmm. um, and um, a lot of trade agreements recently are increasingly addressing investment provisions and a wider range of policy concerns that affect corporate strategies, state intervention, taxation and subsidies, financial flows, et cetera, et cetera. But there is no doubt in my mind that there's a brighter light at the end and there's a greater opportunity that we can both leverage as countries who have had a long relationship, who understand each other uh, pretty well um, to leverage for our mutual benefit. And so um, I'm indeed very happy to uh, be at this Global Chamber webinar mm -hmm. on what the future holds. I am very confident that we can work together and each benefit each other. Uh, but, but the African continental free trade area, for mm -hmm. example, offers a very important market um, for Africa, but also for Ghana in the sense that we are inviting we're inviting manufacturers mm. who export goods to Africa to now come set up in Ghana and manufacture the goods here, such that you can export into this 1.4 billion market, 1.4 billion people market in a tariff-free um, you know, track, which means that you can make more money by investing and producing in Ghana. And, and that is what the reshoring um, opportunity really gives. Uh, and so for all mm. you listening, Yes, we are very happy for you to come to Ghana, but we want you to look into Africa using the Ghana lens. That is a very important thing. We can invest here. We'll work with you to invest and ensure that we mutually benefit from whatever business you set up. So those are my immediate um, co um, uh, comments and um, I will be on so that we can speak some more if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Grant. Uh, as usual, a very insightful presentation. And indeed, I have to agree with Mr. Grant that what makes Ghana unique is um, their optimism. Despite all the challenges, um, they always overcome them. Now, um, I would like to raise a couple of questions. Um, one, um, um, regarding startups and SMEs in Ghana, that uh, they have very good prospects and they encounter some difficulties when seeking funding or investors due to the manner in which they present their documentation. And I'd like to know 
if there is currently a department at GIPC or any other agency in Ghana where um, that could provide assistance in regards to requirements, documentation needed to access uh, venture capital or private equity funds. And then um, regarding agro-processing, um, I would like to know if there's any tip or uh, for startups as well um, to that could make their projects uh, stand out and encourage more participation from uh, British companies. Indeed, those are very pertinent and relevant questions, especially since the start the startup you know universe is mainly dominated by people in the youth bracket. And Ghana, um, in, in more recent times, has been very sensitive to ensuring that this sector is well catered for and uh, enable it to grow as a as a major part of the economy. First and foremost, I mean, government in itself, uh, um, quite a couple of years back recognizing the, the importance of energizing and empowering the youth bracket, especially in startups, actually did give tax concessions to any new um, startup business set up by anybody under the age of 35 as an incentive for young people to go into, into business. But we also had other est establishments and institutions such as the National Entrepreneurship and Innovation uh, Plan, which actually acts as a as a, a government authority or agency which enables incubation, um, startups, et cetera, to go to the next level. And then we have the Ghana Entrepreneurship Authority, which actually provides funding for incubation and funding to early stage going on to growth stages in pro-youth um, uh, companies, as well as uh, companies that are startups. But there is a, a very vibrant, startup universe today, particularly in technology and ICT. And uh, we are seeing Ghana emerge um, as one of the leading country, countries in Africa attracting capital. Um, um, there are quite a number of other, there are even private sector initiatives which are enabling young people um, build their business. And I can cite one like the Macdan business um, competition, which uh, every year he does. Um, and the winner gets 100,000 US dollars to invest into their business. This is a very good example where we see the private sector complementing government's efforts to ensure that there is at least um, there's some bit of light at the end of the tunnel. But beyond that, there's also the president's uh, business competition initiative, where he also funds um, uh, young people who become uh, who lead uh, you know, become victorious in this competition and enable them um, to have financing to go forward. And the uh, GIPC itself, we also have the Youth Entrepreneurship Forum every year where we actually create a platform for young people to demonstrate what they've done and um, seek um, investment into it. And, and so I, I dare say that there is quite a number of things happening in Ghana um, that are very important. And the most important though, is a government sponsored um, program called You Start, which would, um, which would fund and help startups incubate um, to early stage fundraising. And I think that's very important for the economy um, because then we see a, a number of young people who then um, can access funding from the micro level to the you know uh, small level, and that is very important. I will additionally say at GIPC we are actually in December going to um, work with the Egyptian government to create um, an opportunity for startups in Ghana to actually go and present in Egypt to, to raise capital. We had planned earlier on in the year to do it in the GCC, but um, we were not able um, to do it for various reasons. But now I think we are ready to engage, get about 20, 25 startups, most of them in the technology space to actually go and present and um, position themselves for capital. But you did ask two questions about private equity uh, funds and venture capital funds. And I dare say that, I mean, having been in private equity myself and having been in investment banking, I think the, um, the, the strategies or maybe the structure with which traditional private equity firms come onto the continent does not facilitate a good you know, um, working relationship where they are able to find um, good investee companies to exist. I mean, for example, a lot of the private equity firms who come in and say they are minimum 
investment would be about a million dollars for 15 percent of the company um, and they look at specific assets and their locations and specific areas if they are not a generalist fund and that limits the opportunity to fund SMEs and SMIs. Now what we are doing in Ghana is working with a number of agencies and the UNDP um, sponsoring it um, as a sponsor and the GIPCs as one of the main sponsors um, to set up a fund of funds which if we believe we are able to put together, will then create um, or leverage those funds into, into fund managers in the country to fund sustainable projects that are being run by SMEs and SMIs. And I think that is a, a very workable proposition um, for the market, where then you'd have um, fund managers who would probably be doing asset allocations of maybe 100,000 to have a, a um, to have 500,000 pounds worth of, or, 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 or dollars worth of investments, which is more suitable to the market than coming to the market and saying your minimum investment should be 10 million. Because in, in, in Africa, a significant proportion of the companies are small and medium size. And by small, we mean that, you know, maybe enterprise value of 500,000, total value of a million dollars. And, and some of them need just about $100,000 to scale up to the next level, you know. And, and so that we must be mindful of that because those are not suitable to traditional private equity and um, venture capital firms that come to the continent. But the fund of funds structure works much, much better. And I believe that um, once we can establish that, we will go quite a bit of way to improve the investment um, opportunities and for small and SMEs and um, other com uh, startups to raise capital on the continent. But I dare say that we are seeing a marked improvement today. Um, quite a number of Ghanaian startups in, in the technology space have raised funding and are, are expanding uh, to take uh, take care of business. And we believe that this will continue. This is an area where I think that there is great opportunity for British investors who are looking for small companies that have great growth potential. And uh, we therefore look forward to the engagement. I hope I answered your question. Totally, thank you so much. Thank you for the given tools and also for your honesty in the way um, um, collaborations uh, should proceed in the country. Katie, I believe we are a little bit um, um, delaying the next speaker. Yeah, we've got plenty of time. We did book okay. out an hour and a half. We shouldn't go too far. Okay, lovely, now. lovely, but, lovely. Um, yeah. But thank you very much, Mr. Grant. Very valuable insights there. Lots of opportunities to be aware of. There are a couple of questions in the chat bar. Um, right. If you wouldn't mind having a look in there and going back to those guys, and we will I have will. more time for Q&A. Thank you very much. I'd now like to move on to our, our next guest speaker uh, to share further insights around the, uh, the agri-processing. And Bob, I'd like to now um, pin you to the stage and bring you onto the stage to share more, but I'd like to introduce you a little bit first. Thank you for being here. Director of International Business Development for the Barclays Eagle Lab, C4DI and CEO of C4DI Ventures International, and that's in Poland. Um, the C4DI is a Centre center for Digital Innovation and Acceleration Program, which is co-sponsored by Barclays Bank. Now, just to give a bit of background around you, Bob, I just need to talk you up a little bit more here in terms of what your expertise is. Now, you are South African educated. Um, you have an international track record working in over a dozen different countries around the world, very impressive. And you, as a non-exec director, you deliver post-COVID sales ability, sales experience, management experience, and director experience. Um, and you're currently delivering webinars and educational material on behalf of the UK Department of International Trade Export Academy uh, regarding um, skills around international business. So we are absolutely delighted to have you here today share insights. Um, and you're gonna take us through a little bit about what the lab is doing, what are some of the opportunities? And then we, we might take some questions at the end of that, if you don't mind. Over to you, Bob. Well, thanks uh, so much, first of all, uh, for inviting me. And uh, secondly, thanks for that introduction. I, I hope it's been recorded. Um, I'm gonna reuse that. Uh, Greetings from the north of England, the north of England, uh, those on the call in the north of England, it's raining, 
and it's cold. I don't know if that resonates in Ghana, but that's uh, that's how it looks here. I'm going to share a little bit about uh, what we're doing. And then I was going to talk a, a little bit, Katie, about the opportunities uh, that, that appear to exist. So um, th this uh, this little session, this segment is about agri-tech, technology and agriculture, agri-tech. And, and right now in the United Kingdom, right now in the United Kingdom, agri-tech is a very hot topic. It's a very investable uh, topic. I believe that is a word, investable. And you, uh, I noted, uh, I made some notes there. Um, a lot of those are micro businesses in the United Kingdom that, that are probably looking at around about a quarter of a million US dollars to get off the, off the ground. So they're not all businesses that require uh, large uh, sums. So what we have here, uh, Center for Digital Innovation, we have two sites. Uh, one is Kingston upon Hull. And if you look on a map, that's a port and uh, it used to be a fishing port. So there's tremendous volumes of uh, food uh, processing uh, taking place here. So our um, technology lab uh, focuses on that. So if you're familiar with the brands McCain's, they make potato chips. And Aunt Bessie's, they make something called Yorkshire pudding. And there's various fish food processing plants. That they're here in uh, Kingston upon Hull. But our second incubator is in a place called North Allerton. North Allerton. North Allerton. And this is where the new British Prime Minister, he lives nearby in North Allerton. So if you drop by to see us, who knows? He may be uh, doing some British prime ministerial <laughs> stuff uh, in North Allerton, but I think he's going to be pretty busy. So he's probably in London. So North Allerton's a, 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 an agricultural heartland of the UK. Hello there, guys. Are you you're joining or just accidentally? I'll meet everyone. All right. Sorry, guys. I, I've, got, I've got to crack on. I've got to crack on. So it's a, uh, it's the agricultural heartland. It's an area called North Yorkshire, or as some of us would say, North Yorkshire. And it's a big uh, chunk of agricultural land in the UK. It's farmland. And that's why the second incubator focuses purely on agriculture. Agriculture. Now, I'll go through uh, Barclays' involvement. And I'm going to mention another bank, and then I'm going to talk about the opportunities, if that's all right, Katie, as they appear, as they appear. So we're co-sponsored by Barclays Bank, and that means we have two Barclays business development managers uh, on site. And what they're doing, what they're doing, they're talent scouts. They're talent scouts. They're looking for ideas and innovations that can be scaled up. Um, the kind of things that seem to be resonating right now is anything to do with the, uh, let's call it the, the cradle to grave of food production. So it's getting it out of the ground, uh, processing it if that's necessary, the logistics bumps in the road that get it into the shop and onto our plate. So that's, that's the kind of uh, cradle to grave that uh, we're talking about. And I nearly, nearly knocked over a glass of water, but I didn't. So that was a, that was a near miss. Um, Barclays uh, have got three Agritech uh, incubators. So if you look at Barclays Eagle Lab and Agritech, and I believe, Katie, you're in contact with Wendy Hewitson, who's the lead and uh, very focused on uh, Agritech is Barclays Bank. The second bank that's uh, interested in Agritech is British Mercia Bank. Now, because I'm in the north of England, the north of England, uh, British Mercia Bank is in the north of England, and it's in an area of the UK called the Northern Powerhouse, which is Kingston upon Hull, Leeds, Manchester and Liverpool. So it's like a straight line across. It's a competing economy with London. So British Mercia Bank are very active in that region and they're very interested in any technology around food production and food consumption. So that's British Mercia Bank. And they're actually in the office above me, Katie. So if you ever come up here and you wanna meet British Mercia Bank, 
consider it a deal that is done. So the UK market, uh, I'll just do a little recap and then I'll talk about what the opportunity is. So uh, there have been some changes here. There has been some changes. That's right. There's been some changes. We left the European Union. Um, I didn't vote on that myself, but that's what happened. So the UK is no part of the e no longer part of the EU. So that's changed the uh, environment. It's changed the environment. That's the first thing. And then secondly, just like everyone else, we went through the coronavirus, the COVID-19 era. And then uh, just like everyone else, uh, we know about the Ukraine uh, conflict. And just probably like everyone else, you've got an inflation rate uh, that's starting to move. So I'm going to explain what those four things mean to food. So, yeah, it's a busy, you know, a lot of, lot of news there. I'll try and give you some good news. I'll try and uh, lift it up. So since the Brexit, um, the supply chain of food into the United Kingdom, it, it, it has altered. It has altered. So those of you uh, in Africa, whether like South Africa, you were a British colony or not, or Australia, uh, the opportunity to get your goods into the UK, uh, it, it's, it's improved dramatically. It's improved dramatically. It's improved off, off the scale. And the hot point, the hot area of food in the United Kingdom is actually the, the kind of high quality um, end of it. The uh, United Kingdom has moved towards a vegan and vegetarian uh, kind of uh, uh, consumption. And it's very much around, around, obviously that's around vegetables, not meat, vegan and vegetarian. Uh, even I know that, Ingrid. It's about vegetables. So anything to do with uh, getting vegetables into the United Kingdom, that's, that's a real hot button. And if you look at the premium brands in the United Kingdom that distribute groceries, Asda, uh, Sainsbury's, Waitrose, if I'm allowed to plug some of these, I hope they're members. Um, they're very much trying to get the best produce into, into their um, shops. And, and technology has a huge part to play in, in getting the uh, technology into the right area of the economy at the right time for the right price. And I'm happy to be challenged on, on this, but please be, don't challenge me too much, be gentle. Um, at any given moment, uh, the UK has only got about three weeks worth of food stuff. We don't, we don't produce as much as you think that we might. It's just a little island off the North Sea. So uh, getting food produce on time and in the right shape and in the right quantity is critical to the UK. And uh, by leaving the European Union, whether you agree with that or not, a lot of the regulation frameworks, there's a lot more flexibility around what's possible. So that that came out of that came out of Brexit that came out of Brexit and and I don't think there's many people that live in Kent in the UK but if you do there's always queues of lorries trying to get in and get out and so uh, it it you know anything around vegetables another thing to consider is uh, I don't think there's that many British people on on the on the phone maybe Chris Bennett so I might I might get some some barrack in here but British food has improved. It has improved. It has improved uh, con considerably, and it was not known for its food, but now there's a there's a requirement for high quality food, just in general. So anything that's around high quality uh, pro produce, that's the area to play in, not mass production. It's a high quality end. Uh, I can see some people about to fall off their chair. High quality food, the UK, in the same uh, paragraph. But hey, I've just said it, and it's been recorded. So uh, we've got that. Uh, since the coronavirus, uh, most people uh, are getting the deliveries to their home address, to their home address. So anything that facilitates um, produce uh, getting that's consistent with home delivery, that, that's another, another major consideration. Um, uh, the amount of spend on, on fresh food, prepared food, food that's ready to eat, to go straight to the home in the UK, this, is, this has been a real change, a real, a real change. And, and I'm sorry to, to report that you'll see that quite a number of supermarkets are, are actually shutting down their um, high street presence because of this, uh, this, 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 this trend. Um, 
the Ukraine, well, the Ukraine impacts on food because the Ukraine was the breadbasket of Europe. And I'm sure we all hope that that conflict comes to an end, but that will definitely have uh, an, 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 an effect on the food supply in the UK. Uh, the UK is unable to uh, uh, generate um, all the, the grain that it needs. And it needs grain for multiple things, not just uh, 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 bakeries, but it, need, it needs grain and sustenance for the uh, uh, livestock as well. And if we bring on the inflation rate, um, what all of this means is that um, technology in this sector, it's a prime conversation. Anything around uh, agriculture production, mapping of agricultural production, planning of agricultural production, the automation of agricultural production, uh, there's lots of interesting drones, land mapping, improving the viscosity of water, because the UK is trying to uh, improve the return on the land that it already has. And I would say to you, and I'm not obliged to, that the UK has got some of the um, most innovative technology around agriculture, because it has to have. It's the most populated uh, country in Europe, and it has requirements for all this food and of course, it's agriculture technology. It, it's leading. If you're looking to uh, find an audience for new ideas, the UK, Katie, is definitely open for, for business without doubt. Anything around technology, uh, anything around uh, improving yield, anything around trying to improve that uh, cradle to grave uh, journey of out of the ground into the mouth, anything that touches on that journey um, anything that touches on the journey of uh, refrigeration, re refrigeration of food, use of solar panels, uh, the reduction of, uh, of, of, of uh, costs of, of, um, of electricity and, and gas and anything around there associated with, with food. It's, there's such a vast vista of it. We held an event, Katie, about uh, six weeks ago, and the, the amount of ideas some of these were really outlier uh, ideas and you're thinking, how do people uh, think of them? But most of them were micro businesses. The great ideas were not coming from the big companies. They're too busy being a big company. What they're looking to do is search for uh, things that are potentially scalable and get a stake or a license or an early order or an opportunity or support with proof of claim. There's a great deal of that, Katie, and I am involved in Poland, Germany, Czech, Slovak, and Hungary, and the UK is far more advanced as, a, as an early adopter um, in environment for new technology for agriculture. It's probably because uh, our units of agriculture are relatively small. They're about one-seventh the size of the average in Poland, for example. So you the only thing you can do, you, you can't grow any more land is uh, use technology and thinking to get the biggest bang you can for your buck from the land that you've got. So um, I would be looking uh, very much at that. We're also uh, very much uh, fo focused around um, the, the use of greenhouses. That is a really big uh, a deal in the UK uh, right now. In fact, Katie, I'd say it's probably the hottest topic who could expect that? The word greenhouse and the north of England in a sentence. But it's so, it's absolutely so. Um, okay, I know there's not much to uh, smile about uh, climate change, but um, in the UK, uh, the greenhouse economy, it's tripled over 10 years. It's tripled. And anything around uh, getting, getting uh, any innovation around greenhouse production, any innovation, Katie, around... Uh, the use of uh, solar, solar panels, wind farming, com compression of logistics, uh, storage of food, movement of food, uh, high-end food, high-quality food. And I'm looking at the clock. I'm nearly done, Katie. 60 seconds. I'm timing myself. Um, you really got to get yourself over here. Uh, I think because of all these problems, people have, have to be far more open-minded. You know, we've got Brexit, COVID. Ukraine war and inflation rate, people have to be more open-minded here than ever before, Katie, to, to grasp the global economy. People have got no choice. Uh, investors have got no choice, Katie. They, they can't say, oh, well, you know, 
We'll see what's going on locally. They have to take a bigger look at all the great things going on. And that's 10 seconds. So back to you, Katie. I mean, how about that? Thank you very much, Bob. Round of applause, virtual. Um, you know, it, it, very interesting. Like, I'm, I'm curious about a couple of things. And um, um, please, we'll go to questions and answers a bit later. Um, there are a lot of people in the agricultural industry on the call today. What would you say to them in terms of how they can collaborate more with the UK to better enhance how they do business? Well, I'm, I'm going to say this. So I hope you don't mind. Uh, I'd, I'd have a look at the Barclays Eagle Labs and first of all, get involved in the webinars and the newsletters. So I would, I would do that, Katie. Uh, certainly, I know that yourself, that you're, you're, you're doing some great stuff in agri-tech, including getting a, um, a trade mission going. So I'd link with that. Um, I think with the UK, I uh, would be looking, the areas that I would be looking at uh, uh, a high quality produce, the highest quality produce, where is that likely to land? And where it's likely to land, it's in the southeast of the UK, the southeast. So I would be looking for connections in the southeast of the UK, and I'm sure the Ghanaian embassy is very uh, pro proactive there. Um, in terms of technical ideas, Katie, um, it could even be worth you considering doing something separate on it one day. I mean, I've got here from George Boy, and it's a great, it's a great comment there, George. I don't know you. Startups must be equipped with the financial knowledge, and I, I would be looking back in back in Africa. Look at the um, workshops that will exist around financial knowledge, because I think the thing is, Katie, uh, to come to the UK. You've really got to have a sound financial plan. You know, it's, it's, I don't know if that's helping answer your question, but. Very helpful. And I think it is, it's uh, the, these, the, these, um, these events are really there just to spark thought and curiosity around what we can do better. Um, and, and Lewis has just sent me a, a, a direct message. And, and actually my curiosity was why Barclays and why are they interested so much in sp sprouting these ideas? And Lewis actually tapped onto my question that I had for you and said, why did Barclays not stay in Africa and just diversify portfolios instead? So it's kind of broadened out that question to, and it's fully loaded it. But do you have an answer? Yeah, I, I have the answers to, to, to that. I mean, the f first of all, um, the reason Barclays are involved in agri-tech is Bar Barclays as a bank are the bankers of farming. They are the leading bank for farmers. I'm, I'm not here to, to plug that, but in the UK, th that is what they are, that they are the leading agricultural bank. They've got 300 years of experience in, in the requirements of agriculture. So that's why Barclays are attached to that. Um, what happened, uh, Barclays have been uh, rethinking their high street presence in the UK. And that, and that means there's less branches, whichever way you look at it, rethinking, repositioning, pff, there's less. Um, so what happened, uh, they had a pilot run, uh, Katie, of setting up these uh, kind of tech incubators. And these tech incubators, because it was uh, mostly millennials and startups, and these people were running of events and competitions and all of this kind of thing, started to get footfall. And, and whereas the banks themselves weren't getting footfall. And, and that's kind of the genesis towards why Barclays appear to be going down this route operational model, uh, Katie. Um, it's not just tech. Uh, I mean, the incubator that I'm in, there's uh, like about 600 members. Maybe 100 of them are tech companies. There's accountancy firms. There's uh, recruitment companies. Uh, there's all kinds of things in there, Katie. It's almost like a community in a building rather than a high street offer, which you have to go in and out of, if, if that helps explain it a little. Absolutely, and it's been very helpful. And Bob, um, in the best interest of time, we'll keep moving on, but uh, please start connecting uh, with our speakers today to learn more. And you, you did drop a little note there around um, a trade mission next year, which Ingrid and Ruby and I are very working very closely on. So we will announce that a little bit further on. We've got one more speaker and I just wanted to, to give you guys a moment. We did have an hour and a half booked out for this session. We are gonna go into the extra half an hour of time. I'd love for you to continue to stay. We're gonna bring uh, Patricia on just to talk a little bit more about opportunities from her perspective. Uh, but then after that, we're gonna break out into open networking where you guys can have a chat amongst yourselves. We'll also bring you back 
and then ask you what's what some of your questions are we'll open up into discussion so we'll really use that time very well if you do need to drop off please do um, we are recording this so uh, without further ado I'd like to bring to the stage um, uh, Patricia I'm just going to pin you now and I'm going to introduce you um, so, <laughs> That's all right. so, sorry Bob let me let me un unpin you <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Hi, Patricia. Okay. It's lovely to have you. We're just yeah. going to make a short introduction for you. Now, yes. 15 years experience on international trade advisory and business development. So running the protocol in diplomacy, you have worked extensively with several foreign and local SMEs, mid-size and global corporate UK and overseas businesses. You fund aided projects, government departments, etc. So uh, quite an extensive approach to how you've approached international business. You've got great extensive industry knowledge of the business environment with emerging economies. Your expertise is applied to practical business methodologies and you've transformed uh, global opportunities for change and success in business. Now, I also wanted to note you, your previous engagements at the Department of International Trade and you are an international trade advisor for the energy and sustainable sustainability se sectors in West Africa, and also accelerated um, your performance in promoting and developing new strategic business methodologies in that space. So we are so delighted to have you on today. Um, you've been listening in on the conversation. What are your thoughts and what are future trade opportunities look like for you between the two? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Katie. And uh, I would like to also say thanks to Bob and Yofi. Uh, that was quite uh, a robust uh, introduction and, and giving a really good fact sheet in terms of the UK and uh, Ghana and the opportunities that are really there. Um, Ghana is an interesting country. I've always loved Ghana and uh, we've done a lot of work around there. I know that they've shared a lot of fact sheets already in terms of trade statistics and things like that, uh, which I wouldn't want to go into. But recently we've been doing a lot of work when it comes to doing business in Africa. And we realized that culture has become something very important. And I thought we should be talking about that, which is something new. And I thought this is something uh, we could introduce in both trade missions to, to, to Africa, whether it's Ghana or any other country, as well as how people do international business uh, when it comes to these locations. And uh, interestingly, um, looking at the dynamics when it comes to developing commercial awareness and value from dynamics of applications of business and interactions, uh, to corporate communication in terms of managing opportunities is quite very key. Uh, so I thought this is also important for us to know today where we are really applying cultural communication in the way we do business. A lot of people uh, do not understand how the business uh, culture is in, in certain countries. And I think from a cultural side, uh, Ghana is quite sitting in a very beautiful place. Uh, they have a nice culture and that should resonate when we're talking about business and uh, if I remember what Yofi said, he mentioned some of those things already. And I think it's something that we're taking on board. So from our side, uh, because I'm wearing two hats from the international uh, trade investment, as well as the international uh, protocol and diplomacy, we're really harmonizing that in terms of people understanding the power of culture and how that influences uh, the business environment. And when we talk about the business environment, uh, of course, you're talking about political, economic, social, technology. Yofi, Yofi said so many things about, you know, the, the, the dynamics of the digital uh, uh, environment where, you know, there are lots of opportunities, young people want to learn, uh, new businesses want to grow, but we need to start thinking. And, uh, I spent time last two months talking to 60 businesses in South Africa uh, who are really particular about doing businesses in some other countries. And it's so important how culture has become one of the biggest issues when it comes to trade and investment. And it's not just taking the trade missions into these countries, it's also important for um a UK business to begin to understand the capacity and how that can, you know interpret into soft power and how you can actually start using that. So it's more of interactions rather than um, uh, you're talking about the transactions. So everybody talks about the transactions. Nobody's really looking at the interactions. And if you look at the interactions and communication, culture is so important. 
if I see myself in Ghana as a, as a business, I want to see myself in the attire. And if you go into a business meeting wearing all of that cultural, beautiful look, every business on the other side will give you all the attention you need. And I think it's so important. Um, there's so many dynamics when it comes to the cultural essence of doing business internationally. And I don't think we can go into all that today, but just three things. One of them is the dynamics and the applications of the business uh, we do internationally. And, and I think it's so key for us to begin to understand those dynamics and applications. Uh, we're also gonna look, I mean, it's also important for us to look at the developing, I mean, developing the commercial awareness and that value chain uh, and, and culture, you can't you can take culture out of it. And that also brings us to diplomacy. So even with, uh, all of the framework of government between the two governments, uh, the UK government and the and the and the, and the Ghanaians, uh, you find out that there's this balance of understanding. We have a history already uh, of doing business together, and I, and I so enjoy um, what you have said in terms of export import. If you look at all those statistics of import and export, you find out there's been a really good trans. Um, a really good um, uh, increase uh, in in that regard, and. That can only happen because you have a really good communication and, and, and that kind of cultural value uh, that, that's within that value chain. And uh, in terms of the managing the opportunities, uh, culture also plays a role uh, where you have it. I've, I've managed so many trade missions. And one of the things I always tell them, I say to them, when you come into the country for the first time, you should be able to speak one language. If it's a quaba, you should be able to say to the to the to the local company you are meeting, Aquaba, or you sit, or they say to you, Aquaba, you understand what that means. And it's just such a beautiful environment you create in terms of, you know, the way you discuss, the way the communication, body language, um, greetings and things like that. So we're really, we're really pushing that part of things in terms of how businesses are done. And, uh, and I think it's so beautiful. Uh, I've been to Ghana many times. I'm hoping to be there again. And, and I just love you know, the culture and, and everything. And I think it's something that we need to carry away. So I know that it's a bit different because a lot of people are thinking about, you know, international trade and all of those dynamics and things like that. But I thought culture, uh, which is a new area we're really pushing and trying to add that flavor into the trade missions and, and the way businesses are done uh, is quite really excellent. Um, some time ago, uh, I was talking to um, a business, I mean, a business owner, and uh, they were very particular about going into a new market, nothing, nothing. And I said to them, I said, do me a favor when you go in, can you just learn five language, five simple language? When you get into the country, try and say one, of, one or two of these words. And yes, it did so. So even if culture is more than that, but we're just, I'm just trying to say to you the impact of uh, of how that has really translated um, into the way international business is done. And I just thought I should mention that today. And I want to say again, thank you, Yofi, for sharing all of that brilliant uh, statistics of, of Ghana. And also to Bob uh, for giving that balance in terms of what's going on in the UK at the moment and uh, how that can actually help in our business environment. So. Really, really thanks. And I, and I hope it's short. And uh, I'm sorry, I'll not be able to go into all of the nitty gritties of what we put together. But if you have any questions or, um, you know, how you want us to be of help, please reach out to me and uh, we'll, we'll come across uh, again. So thank you once again. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pat. And round of applause to you for sharing these <laughs> insights. And there's something about um, yeah, there, there's the transactional side of business and then there's the doing the business together and the efforts that we put in uh, to developing those relationships. Now, you know, I know that you um, support companies going both ways uh, between the UK. What is your top, what's the number one thing for everybody on the call to be, to be mindful of to enhance their trading abilities with the UK? And, is that um, for me or is that for everyone? For you, Pat. That's, that's oh, my okay. question to you, Pat. Oh, okay. That's all right. Yeah. Um, I think it's more of um, um, the business environment is quite key. So in terms of economics, political, and, and things like that, any business coming into the UK should be able to understand currently what is going on, and, and that could also affect uh, the, the kind of business you do. So it's very important for every business to understand the economic climate 
you know, environment we find ourselves and that and know when exactly is the best time for you to do business. Because sometimes I've found situations where companies want to do business, but it's not just the right timing or probably they don't understand the, the business opportunities surrounding that, 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 um, um, relationship or things like that. So it's very important for businesses to understand. And it's both ways, uh, whether you're going out or you're inward or outward, is very important that you understand the economic climate where, where you find yourself. Thank you, Pat. And, and for me, yeah. I think the clear message and Yofi, Bob and Pat, forward planning is key. Doing your research, making your connections and working with the people that know what they're doing are critical to the success of any trade um, or investment to go successfully. So I, I want to thank all three of you for your insights today, your talk. We're going to break out into some breakout rooms. I hope you've all stayed on for this. I'm about to open the rooms. So please use this time to really just have a chat, talk about what was discussed today, share contact, look for synergies. We'll bring you back to the main room. In I'm probably going to give you guys about eight minutes. So we'll see you back here then. And I look forward to hearing from you what you learned. You should have your breakout invite on the screen. Breakout room invites should be there for you guys.
This meeting is being recorded. Welcome back. I gave you a little bit of extra time. That's, and I don't normally do that. Oh dear. <laughs> we, were, we were engrossed in the discussions. <laughs> oh, I'm sure you were. Well, actually, well, that, that's great to hear. And on that note, if you haven't already shared your details, please do, please save the chat because today is just about connecting you to explore topics and opportunities. The real magic is going to happen when you leave this Zoom room and you make those connections with one another. Now, I'm really, we, 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 I feel really privileged. We have our CEO and founder, Doug, on the call with us today. Doug, would you like to share a few words? Oh, yeah, my, my pleasure, Katie. Um, I, I was just actually writing a LinkedIn post about this, and the first words for me were informative and inspiring. You know, and, and I think Ruby Golo has already given us some sense of the, the economy in uh, Ghana, and, and right now it's a little challenging, right, with inflation and some other, other challenges. One of and hey, the UK, look, look, look at all the things that are going on there. And, and if you point out a, a country that's probably struggling a bit right now on a macro level, a UK in that region would be uh, one of them as well. However, one of the things that we work very hard at at Global Chamber is identifying what the opportunities are so that we can go after them. And one of the keys there is people. Um, I'm, I traveled overnight um, and uh, <laughs> actually speaking of people, so I, on the plane, I sit next to Senator Kirsten Sinema. So how, how's that? That's a, one of the 100 senators in the U.S. and she's actually been very supportive of the Global Chamber. And I was, we were talking about the Exim Bank, which she's been a pioneer for, and we're talked about having her speak at Global Chamber in the early, or uh, the ne in the early part of next year but but this group you know are a bunch of people that i i haven't met yet including bob um who who spoke and um and i don't know yet how to to say your name kofi uh, i guess kofi right uh, kofi grand it's kofi, or, it's kofi or yofi the same it's okay. kofi with a y <laughs> so you're amazing you guys you know and and ladies you know it's just just patricia um for I think I've seen you uh, on LinkedIn and maybe even in the Global Chamber London uh, yeah. meetup, but your knowledge and your expertise is so powerful. So I think what we, to me, what this uh, emphasizes is how important uh, good people are, people that you can trust to find these opportunities and to prosecute the opportunities. So, um, so Ingrid, uh, you're amazing in your moderation. Katie, you're extraordinary. You're off the charts. Thank you all for the information today. Let's stay, all of us stay in touch. Watch for the LinkedIn post that I'm just about to send out and please add to it to make sure that you're all, all connected. Katie, thank you for the opportunity. Keep connected. Thank you. Very much, Doug. I, I, I always love to invite you for a few words because just your experiences and your storytelling really come through and I always love to know what you're up to. And, and actually, I, I second what you say, like Bob, Yofi, Pat and Ingrid, thank you so much for bringing this together today. And a special shout out to Ruby, who runs our Metro in, in Accra, who isn't with us today, but she's put a lot of work in behind the scenes to bring this together. It, it was a great turnout, lots of great sharing of information. That's what it's all about please connect with one another, ensure that you make the most of your time invested today. Uh, Ingrid, Ruby and I are actually working on, um, and even Pat actually, Pat's on our advisory board in London. That's where you know her from, Doug. She's working with us on some of our Africa projects where we bring the communities together. And one of them is gonna be the trade missions. Um, so we want to bring more people out here to the UK from Ghana to learn more about what's happening in the financial services and agricultural space. So watch this space. Uh, it's all ideas at the moment and planning, uh, but this is where great things start. Um, so we'll start to bring uh, more people in the community into that conversation as it develops. And I thank you again. And on that note, we'll end the meeting. If you'd like to know more about Global Chamber, who we are and how we can help you in your business, reach out to myself or Ingrid or Doug. We're happy to help. We get global business. We're here to help you overcome those challenges and accelerate your growth. So please reach out to us. We look forward to working with you. And have a lovely night. Good morning and good evening. Thank, thanks, Katie. And hi, Baco. I see you there. Uh, thanks for all the work that you do as well. Thanks, everybody.
Thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you for your participation. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Mr. Grant. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>